Hey everyone, welcome to 59 Tops Friday presented by Wax Pack Wisdom where we talk baseball history through the cards we love. My name is Jake T. O'Donnell. We built the iconic 1959 Tops baseball set and in this series we're going through every card to talk about the players, teams, and people who made up Major League Baseball in 1959. Today we'll cover cards 142 through 149 in the set. Card number 142 belongs to Dick Stigman of the Cleveland Indians. Stigman was a stud pitching prospect for the Indians out of Minnesota through the late 1950s, sporting 17 wins and a 2.44 ERA between AA and AAA in 1958. He made his Indians debut in 1960 and was selected to the AL All-Star squad after a strong start to the season, although he didn't pitch in either All-Star contest that year. Stigman enjoyed his best success in MLB following a trade to his home state Twins. In 1963, Stigman won 15 games and sported a 3.25 ERA in 241 innings for Minnesota. From there, his career stagnated and he was injured for a portion of the 1965 season. And he did not pitch in the World Series for the Twins that year. His final MLB season was with the Red Sox in 1966. He retired after 1967 and went into business in the Minneapolis area. As of this recording, Stegman is 88 years old and will turn 89 in January of 2025. Card number 143 belongs to Willie Tasby of the Baltimore Orioles. Tasby was a graduate of Oakland's McClymonds High School, which also produced Hall of Famer Frank Robinson, Kurt Flood, Veda Pinson, and basketball legend Bill Russell, among numerous other pro athletes. Tasby was signed when the Orioles still played in St. Louis, and established himself as a well-rounded prospect in the minors who could play center field, hit for power, and steal bases. He debuted in Baltimore in 1958, but never found success in MLB like he had in the minors. He was dealt to Boston in 1960, who then allowed him to go to Washington in the expansion draft for 1961. Tasby played a full year there and hit 17 homers, but would not play consistently in MLB again, appearing part-time for the Indians in 1962 and 1963. Card number 144 belongs to Jerry Walker of the Baltimore Orioles. Walker signed out of Oklahoma in 1957 and went immediately to the majors before throwing a pitch in the minor leagues at all. He had a strong debut for the Birds, mostly pitching out of the bullpen, sporting a 2.93 ERA in 27 and two-thirds innings. Walker pitched mostly in the minors in 1958 and came out strong for the Orioles in 1959. He became the youngest pitcher in MLB history to start an All-Star game that year. Walker started and relieved through the rest of his eight-year career for the Orioles, Athletics, and Indians. After his pitching career ended, Walker was a scout, a minor league manager, and a big league coach before moving into a front office role. He spent one year as the Tigers general manager in 1993 and then became a key assistant to Walt Jockety first in St. Louis and then Cincinnati, winning a World Series ring with the Cardinals in 2006. As of this recording, Walker is 85 years old and turns 86 in February of 2025. Card number 145 belongs to Dom Zanny of the San Francisco Giants. Zanny was born in the Bronx, went to high school in Brooklyn, and was signed by the Manhattan-based Giants in 1951. After five solid minor league seasons, Zanny debuted for the Giants following their move to San Francisco late in the 1958 season. He appeared sparingly in MLB over the next three seasons and was part of a deal with the White Sox that sent hurlers Don Larson and Billy Pierce to the Giants. Zanny was a key swing man for the 1962 White Sox in 86 innings, sporting a 375 ERA. He was traded to the Reds in 1963 where he pitched through 1966. Card number 146 belongs to Jerry Zimmerman of the Boston Red Sox. Zimmerman was signed as a teenage catcher out of Oregon, but he toiled in the minors for years and was released by the Red Sox in 1959. The Orioles signed him immediately, but he did not appear in the majors and they released him that year too. The Reds took a chance on him and he finally made it to MLB with them in 1961. Zimmerman played in two games in the World Series that year as a defensive replacement. After that season, Zimmerman was sent to the Twins in a trade where he would back up Earl Batty over the course of the next several seasons. He was then a coach and scout in MLB for two decades after his playing career. 
Card number 147 is the next multiplayer card in the series, Cubs Clubbers, featuring Dale Long, Hall of Famer and 1959 National League MVP Ernie Banks, and Walt Morin of the Chicago Cubs. Here is the narrative Topps wrote on the back of the card. In these three stars, the Cubs have the top right-handed slugger in the National League and a pair of top-notch southpaw blasters. Over half of the Cubs homers came from their potent bats. Ernie had a great year and wound up with the top honors in homers and RBIs. For his great performance, he won the NL Most Valuable Player Award. In five full seasons with the Cubs, Ernie has averaged an astounding 36 home runs per year. Dale's greatest performance was his eight homers in eight consecutive games in 1956. One of the most willing competitors in the game, Dale has even seen action as a catcher, a left-handed one at that. Walt has found a cozy home at Wrigley Field and has won a warm spot in the heart of Cubs fans. After starting in the Dodger organization, he hit his stride when he came to the Windy City. Card number 148 belongs to Mike McCormick of the San Francisco Giants. 1959 was McCormick's fourth MLB season. McCormick was a California kid who started with the Giants when they were still in New York and then moved with the club back to his native state after the 1957 season. He didn't really find his footing until 1960 when he made both NL All-Star teams and led the NL with a 270 ERA. McCormick made both All-Star teams again in 1961. In 1962, McCormick missed significant time with a shoulder injury and watched the Giants World Series loss that year from the bench. He was traded to Baltimore in the winter and he spent most of the next two years there mostly injured. The nearby Senators took a chance on McCormick in 1965 and he reinvented himself as a screwball pitcher with the Giants reacquiring him for 1967. This would prove to be a shrewd move for San Fran. With his new arsenal, McCormick led the NL with 22 wins and had a 285 ERA in 262 and a third innings. For his efforts, McCormick was the runaway winner of the 1967 NL Cy Young Award. He pitched well the next two years before injuries returned. McCormick finished up with the Yankees and then the Royals and in total threw over 2,300 innings in a 16-year MLB career. Card number 149 belongs to Jim Bunning of the Detroit Tigers. 1959 was Bunning's fifth MLB season. Bunning signed with the Tigers as a teenage pitching phenom out of Kentucky ahead of the 1950 season. He made it to the big leagues in 1955 and became a dominant starter in 1957 when he led the AL with 20 wins in 267 and two-thirds innings, making the all-star team and finishing top 10 in league MVP voting. Bunning no-hit the Red Sox in July of 1958. He would make AL All-Star teams again in 1959 and 1961 through 1963, and he'd lead the AL in strikeouts in 1959 and 1960. Bunning was an outspoken player advocate and was critical in the formation of the MLB Players Union. For these reasons, he clashed with Tigers management, and they traded him to the Phillies ahead of the 1964 season. In 1964, Bunning had no bigger moment than the first game of a doubleheader against the Mets on June 21st. He threw a perfect game, the seventh in MLB history, and the first in the National League in 84 years. Bunning was second in NL Cy Young voting in 1967, leading the league with 302 and a third innings pitched. He later pitched for the Pirates, Dodgers, and then back to the Phillies for his final two years. All told, Bunning pitched 17 seasons was a nine-time All-Star, and retired with the second most strikeouts in MLB history only to Walter Johnson. In 1977, Bunning first ran for political office in his home state of Kentucky. He was first elected to Congress in 1986. For years, Bunning had more success in electoral politics than in baseball Hall of Fame elections. The baseball writers never elected Bunning, although he came close a few times. The Veterans Committee finally elected him in 1996. Two years later, upon winning election to the United States Senate, Bunning earned a unique place in both baseball and American history. To date, he is the only person to be elected to both the Baseball Hall of Fame and the United States Senate. 
That's going to do it for this edition of 59 Tops Friday on Wax Pack Wisdom. Do you have a story about one of the people, players, or teams we discussed today? Let us know in the comments. We'd love to hear it. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss any of our Wax Pack Wisdom content. In the video description, you will find our source material for this episode, links to where you can follow us on all social media channels, as well as a list of our favorite nonprofits and charities. Please consider a donation to one of them if you enjoyed this content. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time on Wax Pack Wisdom. Take care.